Is it even possible in the age of denialism, decadence and nihilism to see a religious awakening? I'm going to walk you through the history of religion in the age of the internet to understand the current vibe shift. And then we'll be in a better position to predict exactly what shape, if any, this new religious awakening will have. Here I'm speaking only of the West and I'm taking the position of an objective outsider as I was not born in the West. If you feel that society feels weird and wrong nowadays, you are not alone. We live in the age of nihilism and neo-socialism. You see, it wasn't always like this. It accelerated with 9-11. 9-11 was the true vibe shift. 9-11 was as important an event to the destiny of mankind as was the sack of Rome. 9-11 was the key event of the century and so much of the current bullshit can be traced back to that one afternoon. 9-11-2001 marks the end of the past century and the beginning of the neo-socialist era. 9-11 was fundamental in shaping religion in the millennial generation. And of course, it was them who shaped the current era. I remember those events clear as day. I remember it because I was young, right? I walked into my home after spending the day outdoors climbing trees and eating berries. My mother was crying looking at the TV screen. And I was confused. I was confused because bombings and terror attacks, this kind of stuff happens in the news and my mother had watched them before without crying about it. This time it was different. Turns out my mother was crying because she knew her brother, my uncle, worked at the World Trade Center. Even though I was very young, I understood that everything had changed. 9-11 was a victory for the enemies of the United States. There's no question about this. If the goal was to destroy the United States, then they succeeded. The United States we live in now it's not the real United States. I remember a time where airports had no TSA security. We just grabbed boarding passes and just walked to the gate. And you'll see this in movies like Home Alone, you know, old movies which were shot before 2001. If you read Edward Snowden's account of 9-11, which every freedom-loving man and women should read, you would see how the CIA, NSA, and other governmental bodies basically got unlimited power and zero accountability after 9-11. The vile abortion of the Patriot Act was born in the fires of that unholy day. Immediately after 9-11, there was a surge in patriotism and Christianity, and all of America was united for one brief moment in time. 9-11 could have been the catalyst for a new golden age for America, where the citizens of the land were united in purpose and mission. But this was not to be. The wars and the lies that came after 9-11 killed any trust in the United States. The United States that stood for freedom and liberty was exchanged for a surveillance state of disunity and distrust. This brings us a few years later to 2005. 9-11 happened in 2001. 2005, the war was still raging in Afghanistan and Iraq, but people had kind of moved on with their lives and the internet became a cultural force for the first time. Today, it's easy to imagine that the culture is shaped by the internet, but at the time, it was actually unheard of. The internet had existed since the 90s, but it was a place for business activity, emails, and porn. But by 2005, there's actually stuff to do for just normal people online. Internet speeds had gotten to a point where video sharing at mass scale was finally possible. And this was the golden era of YouTube. Mid-2000s YouTube was just a different kind of energy. I actually kind of feel bad for the young guys who never got to see the true potential of YouTube. Everybody right now on YouTube is here to make videos to make money about anything else. Video sharing on YouTube is seen as lead generation for businesses. But during 2005, nobody expected to make a single dollar. So all the biggest names at the time were people who started uploading for no reason other than, than wanted to make some videos. I seek to emulate the energy of this era. I want to make videos for a purpose greater than just making money. I want making money to be a side effect of making videos. This was the first time when legit celebrities could be created on YouTube. This was the era of PewDiePie and uh, Negahega. There was Jenna Marbles and Philip DeFranco. Hamza was like 10 years old at the time and Tate himself was 25, something like that. At the time, there was two important cultural movements that shaped early YouTube. The first was the pickup artist movement, which I spoke about in my previous videos. I'll be very brief about it here. But it's basically a bunch of young guys realizing that everything they thought they knew about girls was just naive bullshit. They used scientific level analysis to get laid. There was Neil Strauss, there was Mystery, there was Tyler Durden came into play. The, the genesis of the red pill comes from this era. 
Our dating vocabulary even comes from this era. We speak about things like lay count, day game, looks maxing, approach anxiety, cold approach. All this terminology comes from that era. And I described this in the previous videos. I'm not going to go into it too much here. I will instead speak of the second movement that shaped YouTube. And this was the more important cultural movement. It was called the New Atheist Movement. Most people don't know this, but there was a concerted and vigorous attempt to remove religion from internet culture and indeed all of society. This was the New Atheist Movement of the mid-2000s. And to my eternal cringe, I was a part of this movement just as I was a part of the PUA movement. There was actually a lot of crossover between these movements. The big difference was that this movement was pioneered not by a bunch of horny nerds, but by actual scientists and intellectuals. We had Christopher Hitchens, a remarkable and prescient journalist who literally predicted the deranged LGBT-fueled feminism and the transgender propaganda a decade before it happened. We had Sam Harris, a super sharp neurobiologist who tried to study God and religion from a neurological perspective. We had Dan Dennett, a legit philosopher, and we had Richard Dawkins, a wonderful writer and an expert biologist who literally coined the term meme and redefined the way genetics was understood to this day. These four were called the four horsemen of the apocalypse or of atheism, and they set out with the express goal of demolishing the logical and moral underpinnings of religion, mostly Christianity. Why? Because 9-11 had stirred up religious fervor in the U.S., especially in the Bible Belt, you know, Texas, Georgia, the Carolinas. The big churches in this region were pushing for change in public education. They wanted to teach intelligent design in public schools instead of evolution through natural selection. This, of course, created conflict. So what happened here was Christopher Hitchens got into the fray because he wanted to have separation of church and state. Dawkins got into it because he was already a renowned biologist and he saw intelligent design as a bunch of nonsense. The main points of the new atheists were basically this. First, religion is immoral because it makes people do acts of great harm. They used 9-11 as the main example for this. They argued that without religion, the world would be a more peaceful place. Second, they said that religion did not have sufficient scientific backing. They believed that anything that didn't have sufficient science behind it should be treated as unknown and blind faith had no place in a thinking man's mind. And whatever your beliefs might be about this, the four horsemen of the new atheist movement were excellent at debate. They were clear with their beliefs, they spoke with intelligence and precision, and I'd go so far as to say that they won every single debate they went to. They debated Catholics, they debated creationists, Islamic thinkers, they even debated the New Age spiritualist types, and they came out on top every single time. Despite their unbroken string of victories though, you probably don't even recognize these names. At the tail end of the movement around 2010, the new atheists stood victorious over their enemies only to see that the arena was empty. By 2010, everything that was to be said about the pros and cons about religion had been said and people heard every basic argument and had already made up their minds as to which side they belonged to. Thousands of people had moved away from religion under the absolute firepower of the new atheist arguments and nobody could really debate science and religion again on YouTube because everybody kind of knew where that debate would eventually end up. It looked as though religion had finally been logically defeated, but something new and funny happened. So a new religion emerged and hijacked the new atheist movement. It was the funniest cultural shift I'd ever seen and to this day, the godforsaken social justice warriors took over new atheism. You probably don't even recognize that term because it's fallen out of fashion. But SJW, social justice warrior, was at that time the new big bad enemy. Suddenly, the new atheists and the religious folk found themselves on the same side, trying to defeat this new monster that this atheist had created. Now, I am no atheist now, but I'm immensely grateful for the cultural achievements of the new atheist movement. New atheists like Hitchens and Dawkins combined the power of Greek philosophy with the knowledge of modern science. The new atheists weren't bad people, they just chose the wrong enemy. They thought that the creationists and the Christians were the enemy, while well, actually they were allies against the neo-socialists. The new atheist stuff kind of died down, as Gamergate took over YouTube. I briefly described Gamergate in my previous video, but I will give you a whole new angle into this. Gamergate was the scandal that rocked the gaming industry. The feminist SJWs had slowly crept up and infected the gaming media outlets and they used their power to attack men, specifically straight white men as being a bunch of rapists, 
creeps and misogynists. So all nonsense, of course, and it came to light later that all these sexual harassment allegations were just baseless lies for political gain. The Me Too movement that came later was actually a child of Gamergate. Naturally, there was a reaction to the SJWs. The supporters of the new atheist movement became the first anti-feminists of the Gamergate era. The perfect example of this was Sargon of Fakad and Thunderfoot. They went from making anti-creationist videos to making anti-feminist videos. They were already good, they were already practiced in logical thinking and debate, so they were able to crush the feminist arguments. It was like looking at a bunch of toddlers breaking toys. In fact, the debates of what it meant to be a man or a woman in this era laid the intellectual foundations of the Hamza and Tate era. But the first objective was just to win the culture war against the leftists. The science versus religion war was over and the gamers versus feminists war had started. But even this wouldn't last very long. Gamergate happened in 2015, but another cultural event, a massively important cultural event, happened in 2016. So about a year later, the Brexit referendum. The Brexit referendum was basically the British people giving a big fuck you to the European Union because the EU was placing a lot of restrictions on the British economy and was flooding the British Isles with immigrants. So it was another cultural issue, right? A bunch of elites basically had decided that Europe didn't belong to the Europeans. Now that's a topic for a different discussion, but this changed the face of YouTube yet again. This was a new war of globalists versus populists. This was the same movement that pitted Trump against Hillary in that same year. The great meme war of 2016 had begun. Trump was the populist and Hillary was the globalist shill to be mocked. Funnily enough, Brexit also marked the true and final end of the new atheist movement. Dawkins basically humiliated himself by entering the cultural arena on the globalist side. Dawkins was a biologist, so he didn't really understand why it was that the Britons wanted to leave the European Union. So what happened was Brexit happened because the British people were sick and tired of the dumb EU regulations and mass enforced immigration, systemic destruction of the British culture. The British people voted for independence from EU tyranny. The British people hoped for a resurgent and vitalized nation, but of course, looking back from 2024, that clearly has not happened. Dawkins argued that the Brexit was a mistake and the referendum should be ignored. Essentially, the people's will should be ignored. Sargon of Akkad won, and Dawkins were at odds for the first time, and Sargon crushed Dawkins in his videos because Sargon understood politics, Dawkins understood biology. The other three horsemen also retreated from the field. Sam Harris got tired of controversy and he left. Christopher Hitchens got cancer and friggin' died. Dan Dennett just faded away into academia where he always belonged. Across the Atlantic, in the US, the meme factories were open for business and the great meme war of 2016 was fully underway. In the winter of 2016, Trump took the throne, but it wasn't the end of the culture war. The entire four years of the Trump presidency was a period of great cultural conflict. The conflict was about what it meant to be an American, but it was also so much more. The leftists tried to make Trump seem like this monster, which he clearly wasn't. But it's actually clearer now than ever that the Trump years of presidency were actually some years of peace and quiet compared to the absolute shit show that is the Biden presidency. Two groups had basically formed in the years of conflict. The pro-free speech, pro-freedom, broadly right-wing coalition, and the opposite was the pro-censorship, pro-LGBT, pro-feminist, left-wing coalition. So where did religion come into all this? I'll tell you. A new era of conflict started with the introduction of Bill C-16 in mid-2017. So not too long after the Trump presidency had begun, one unknown Canadian professor takes up a position against the transgender agenda. He's smart, articulate, and very, very well read. He looks at the government mandate to use these transgender pronouns and says, I'm not doing it. Jordan Peterson has entered the scene and immediately causes a huge vibe shift. The new atheists, well, it's in the name, they were obviously atheists. Even the anti-feminists like Sargon were at the time atheists. But Jordan Peterson, he was the first internet icon who was unquestionably knowledgeable about science, but was sympathetic to religion. He didn't think Christianity was this dark aid ideology that should be buried at the end of the century. JP revitalized religion by explaining the Bible in a new way. He used evolutionary biology and psychology to explain ancient truths. This was the opposite of the new atheists. 
the new atheists had created a huge cultural rift between science and religion, but Jordan Peterson was kind of mending that rift. He explained that the Bible was not a book to be discarded, but it actually was a part of the solution to the problems of the modern age. On one side, he fought a brutal campaign against the leftoids for free speech and individualism. And on the other, he provided a new Christian framework for those looking for a meaning in life. Recently, Huberman talks about how he believes in God. He was asked about it and he quotes the great Heisenberg of the uncertainty principle fame. He says, the first gulp from the glass of the natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. The quote is basically saying that if you start learning science, it seems irrational to believe in a higher power. But as you learn more and more, it just doesn't feel that irrational anymore. And this has been my journey as well. I was an atheist in my first year of undergrad as a bioengineer, but by the end of undergrad, I was an agnostic. A few years into the PhD program and things changed even more. Even the new atheists have recently changed their minds. Recently Dawkins talks about how he's a cultural Christian. He talks about how he loves the cultural aspects of Christianity. You know, he loves Christmas carols and hymns and cathedrals and churches. But here's the thing, you don't get Christmas without Christ. You cannot have your beautiful architecture, music, poetry and art without divine inspiration. Look at the art and architecture made in the godless, atheistic and modern world. These are artless and soulless creations compared to the works of men who are divinely inspired. I think the best argument against the postmodern, atheistic and nihilistic worldview is not an argument that can be put into words but rather can be just seen and felt. Just look at the differences in the artistic expressions of these eras. The fact that Dawkins now supports Christianity, which is hilarious, is a huge indicator of the current vibe shift. I'll give you another example which you'll actually recognize. Jimmy Zhang, this guy is a great YouTuber. He is the king of Asian Riz. He's made videos about dating girls from practically every country and even many porn stars. He was in the streets, he was on the streets, and he was off the streets, but he recently quit. And he tells in his video why. It's a very good video and it's very authentic. He says, simply, he doesn't want to be a whore. Everybody is realizing that the hedonism of the past years, especially post-COVID, has not led to any kind of lasting happiness. In some sense, the hedonism and materialism of the Tate and Hamza era are a result of our collective loneliness and depression during the lockdowns. Now that that hedonic treadmill has run its course, people are realizing that the currency of hedonism is just plain old nihilism. To look ahead, we must look back. The Renaissance was a blossoming of culture like the world hadn't seen in generations. The Renaissance was a fusion of the Christian and the classical. The greatest minds of the generation saw that they could harness classical vitality and heroic energy and channel it through Christianity. I think this is what is coming to the West. I think the normies will continue on the trajectory of decline, but a new and revitalized spirit is coming to the intelligentsia of the West, and you are in the absolute forefront of this shift. In this video, I'm not going to try to change your views on anything. I have nothing to say to those who are not already like me, and less do I care about convincing. When I mentioned Gamergate and the war of the feminists versus the gamers, I didn't tell you who won. The goddamn feminists won. Look at all the gaming media outlets right now. Nothing's really changed. The feminists not only kept their ground but actually solidified their position. I uh, look at the new atheist movement. What happened here? The atheists objectively won every debate but there was no surge in atheism, just a surge in nihilism. And those with religious beliefs just kept doing their own thing anyway. And who won Brexit? The populists might have won the referendum and Trump might have won the election, but the main thing they wanted to stop was mass immigration and the collapse of their cultures. But they ultimately, they failed to do so. The great immigration and cultural crises of the West are now worse than they've ever been. Right now, I have friends in my unit helping the Texas National Guard to protect the border. They put up fences, but the feds just come and remove them the next day. The point is merely this. The side that has true believers always wins. True believers play the long game. True believers will do whatever it takes to ensure that they get what they want. Debate and logic is useful, but faith is ultimately the more powerful force. Social justice warriors were true believers. Creationists were true believers. The neo-socialists are true believers. 
If we stay on the current path, the neo-socialists will grind all virtue into dust. They've already destroyed the universities, which used to be a true beacon in the dark. They've destroyed the public school systems, which to be fair, there's already a psyop. They've destroyed the childhood of so many young and confused kids with their poisons, both mental and chemical. They are the enemies of freedom, beauty, and achievement. But they are not stupid, they are not lazy, and they are at the edge of victory for a good reason. They are more powerful than you think. It is not just a bunch of dumb kids in college with blue hair. Speaking of which, these dumb kids do eventually enter the workforce and saturate the HR departments. And HR is in charge of hiring and firing decisions regardless of the employee's performance metrics. It is not just the media and Hollywood who are guilty for the most egregious crimes against women who will point their dirty fingers at the common man. It is not just the whore politicians who sell out to the highest bidder. It is also the bankers and the financiers who pull the strings that truly matter. So what will happen now? That is the question, is it not? So let me lay it out to you, my argument piece by piece, just like the new atheists would. First, the West is under existential threat from economic collapse, cultural dilution, and unchecked immigration. Second, every time the West has come close to collapse, there has been some kind of a defense mechanism that kicks in to save the day. If one and two are true, then we can expect that defense mechanism to start forming very soon. Question is, what form will this take? Will there be a return to Christianity? No, not exactly, because the kind of Christianity that's taught in the churches is the lamest, most boring, low testosterone version of Christianity. In fact, I consider the kind of Christianity would be an extension of leftism. Think about it. How many churches have you seen with the rainbow flag flying? The Pope, the head of Catholicism, washes the feet of Muslim immigrants. The type of Christianity that is all about turning the cheek and to love their neighbor is not what we need right now. The modern church has perverted these teachings to mean that Christians should just tolerate any humiliation and should welcome unlimited immigration. This is the regime-approved Christianity. This is the Christianity of the fat little pastor or the nerd theologian who would rather sit inside and read books rather than go outside and experience the beauty of creation. This is the religious arm of the neo-socialists. This is not the only Christianity there is, however. Again, we look to history. Yes, it is true that Christ said, turn the other cheek. But how many cheeks do you have? You have two. So basically, you get two strikes and you're out policy. The first time you tolerate it, the second time you endure it, but the third time, it is game over. This is the form of Christianity that will come to resurgence. It will not appeal to the masses, but that's okay. This is the type of Christianity that will appeal only to the intelligentsia. The intelligentsia are the young, ambitious, and intelligent group of people, both men and women, who will shape culture in the next decades. In other words, it is you. This vital Christianity is the most powerful ideology that's ever been seen on the face of this earth. This is the ideology that, that fueled the art and sculpture of the Renaissance. Let me explain this more clearly. During the Renaissance, the greatest minds did not just look towards Christianity. They looked to the classical pagan era for inspiration. This proved that it was possible to take the heroic ideal and love for beauty that the pagans had and combine it with the structure of the church. I should explain what the word pagan means. It simply refers to the pantheons of the gods the people believed in before Christianity. There are many flavors of this. There was the Roman pantheon, there was the Greek pantheon, there was the Norse pantheon, and of course there was the Indo-European pantheon. Jupiter, Zeus, Odin, and Indra was the same deity. Nobody is expecting anybody to start believing in these old gods, right? But rather take the love for adventure, beauty, and expansion from these cultures and nourish them within the Christian framework. The Renaissance was a synthesis of classical thinking, Christian frameworks, and scientific inquiry. By combining the three, you had something that was more powerful than any one of them would have been independently. Renaissance men read classical works. They read Virgil, Plato, Chaucer, and Aristotle. Some of them were intensely religious, like Botticelli, who painted the birth of Venus, a pagan deity. Michelangelo painted or sculpted classical figures that was commissioned by the church itself. And one must remember that the Renaissance was not a time of peace. It is not the case that a bunch of painters and poets could just work on their art carefree. Actually, it was a period of great technological advancement, especially in warfare. Did not Da Vinci draw sketches for tanks and helicopters? Firearms became more than just a niche armor-piercing weapon. Culverins were invented, a special kind of a long cannon, basically. It would shatter old fortifications, so new kind of castles had to be built, and these were called star forts. 
and they were designed to specifically combat the new weapons technology. And I'll give you even more examples of this warlike and vital Christianity. Think of the great explorers of the Age of Sail. I was in Portugal last summer and I saw the fruits of vital Christianity right in front of me. And even before that, think of the Reconquista. Think of all of Spain was taken over by invading forces and Christendom looked lost. But then a man of great vitality arose by the name of El Cid and he pushed the foreign influence out and ushered in a golden age for his people. Some of the greatest warriors of history were Christians. The Templar hosts, the Portuguese tercios, Teutonic knights and the winged hussars of Poland and even before them, the legios of Byzantium did not Justinian, a Christian emperor, command Belisarius to take the cataphractari and bring Rome back into Christendom. The Christianity of the fat little pastor in your local church is not the only option that you have. Think of Charles Martel, the hammer of France. Did he not crush the invading Muslim forces despite being outnumbered? Did he not do this deed in the name of Christ and crown? And in more recent times, the founding fathers of the United States were literally the perfect examples of vital Christianity. They were not fans of the old claustrophobic and decaying churches of Europe, and they were certainly not enemies of Christianity. They embraced the spirit of expansion of the classical Greeks and the Romans, and they built great architecture in the Greco-Roman style. In fact, the founding fathers were the perfect examples of the Renaissance man. They were writers, politicians, leaders, scientists, and warriors. This is the spirit that I want to see reawakened. Now, listening to this, you might think, well, I'm not a Christian, so what do I do? Well, firstly, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm making a prediction of what's coming rather than a prescription. Christianity is the bedrock of the West, not Islam, not Hinduism, not Baha'i, not Shinto. The thing is, you don't need to be a hardcore Christian to be a part of this. Anybody who wants to stand for a greater future can stand for all this. Do you believe in a higher power? Do you stand against neo-socialism? Well, that's all you really need. The real enemy is atheistic nihilism and the cultural and demographic shift that is being forced upon the West. Like I mentioned, Richard Dawkins, the most insistent enemy of Christianity, has turned around and said that Christianity is actually worth defending. In fact, if you ask Jordan Peterson if he believes in God, he actually never says yes or no. He always says, I act as though God exists. I always thought this was hogwash. I always thought he was trying to avoid the question by using fancy words and philosophy. I don't think so anymore. There's some truth in what he says. Nobody can just decide to have faith. Faith is not a switch that you can simply turn on and off. If I tell you I'll give you a million dollars if you believe for one day that the sky was purple, you still couldn't really do it. There's no way to choose consciously to have faith or believe anything. But by acting as though you do have faith in a higher power, is a potential first step. You instantly get a power boost if you do this. Prayer absolutely gives you a power boost. Now, I had to find my own way to that point and learn how to harness this power because nobody really teaches this in any really understandable way anymore. But there is a way. Think about this. The greatest weaknesses of self-improvement is that it is so self-centered. Self-improvement begins and ends with you. It all hinges on how to improve yourself for your own gratification and really nothing more. It could be girls, it could be cars, or the most boring of all, it could be just a bank balance, peasant mentality. Instead of going to the gym for female attention, what if you went to the gym to honor the temple that is your body? What if you dedicated the last and most difficult set to something greater? This is a practical change that you can make right now. Start dedicating things to something bigger than yourself. This extends to other things, and of course, if you don't want to do spiritual stuff, that's fine. If you're at work, cool. Dedicate the work not just to your advancement, but perhaps to the family you plan to have, the kids who are yet to be born, the ancestors who allowed you to exist. This gives you a frame that absolutely swallows nihilism. You cannot be nihilistic if you go about your daily tasks with a degree of excellence because you aren't doing everything for yourself, but always for something greater. This frame will naturally lead to doing higher quality work because you cannot possibly do lower quality work and dedicate it to any higher power. Do it for God, your family, your parents, your future legacy. You can see the truth of this in the gym. Dedicate your last set to the heavens and you will notice the weights feel lighter. Try this today and tell me if it doesn't work. It's not just the gym, of course, where this applies. If you're struggling with NoFap or any kind of addiction, squeak out a tiny prayer before typing the letter P on the keyboard. I guarantee you won't be able to finish typing it out. You basically take your small amount of willpower and multiply it times infinity. 
If you're struggling with diet, it's very hard to stuff your mouth with Cheetos, knowing that your body is the temple of your spirit. This even extends to social skills and charisma. When you move through the world with the feeling that the forces of heaven have got your back, you just give off a different kind of energy. People notice it and they take you seriously. I know this sounds crazy. I know this sounds made up. I can easily make some kind of pseudo-scientific rationale saying, well, people are just responding to your newfound confidence, right? But who cares? I don't care about the explanation of why it works, just that it does. If you want a full, more like actionable guide, let me know in the comments. This video is mostly the knowledge. The second part of this is how do you tap into that vital energy that I spoke of? There are two answers. The first answer is in esoteric health. I've made many videos about this topic and I would like you to put them into action. The second answer is to absorb energy from past heroes. Every culture of this earth has a version of this. There are energies that can be absorbed by reading about the deeds of Achilles, Caesar, and Alexander. If Eastern vitalism is more to your taste, then read the Ramayan and the Mahabharat. The heroism and the grand adventure of the East is no less than the West if you know what to look for. Specifically, here's what I recommend. All men and women of the new intelligentsia must read the Iliad. This is non-negotiable. However, the Iliad is a difficult book to get into because it gives zero context for the Trojan War. It jumps right into the middle of the story and gives zero character introductions. It assumes that the reader is already familiar with the setting. So I don't recommend the Iliad for a beginner or a novice. Instead, you should read Troy by Stephen Fry. This is an amazing book that does justice to the Iliad while actually improving upon it by providing context, historical analysis, mythological analysis, and additional stories from the same time period to give you a rounded experience of the Trojan War. One of the best books I've ever read, strongly recommend. So is this surge of vital Christianity going to sweep across the West? No, it is not. The normies will never understand this. Think about how a normie will, will react to this video. They won't get it, right? The average person is not courageous enough to be a Christian, nor do they have the raw, vital energy of the classical man. They cannot be a part of this movement, and that's fine. Cultural change does not come from convincing everybody of your views. Cultural change comes from the, the conversion of the intelligentsia. The current intelligentsia are informed by their college education, and it's not serving them. The leftist thought leads only in one direction, downwards. It leads to socialism, atheism, and eventually hedonism, nihilism, and even physical ugliness. Leftists pursue pleasure above all, because why not? The leftist thought believes that nothing really matters because at the end of the day, everything ends in the heat death of the universe, so there's no logical point in denying pleasure. Firstly, we do not know if the universe will end in a heat death, and secondly, there is an antidote to nihilism. In fact, there's more than one antidote to nihilism. One of the antidotes is faith, but there are other answers as well. The pursuit of beauty, legacy, family, and art. Nobody even talks about these. Even the self-improvement guys will basically cap out at build body, get girls, buy cars. This is why I believe we will see a revitalization of this ancient spirit. The new intelligentsia will be informed not by the top-down structures of the university systems nor the big and famous celebrities, but by doing their own research and reading. They will be informed by reading history and philosophy, but by also watching YouTube videos. And why not? YouTube is the new public square. This is the battlefield of ideas. And this is where the ideas of the new intelligentsia will be shaped, and you will be the one to shape it. Now, if you decide to go the Christian route, I have one more tool of power for you. I'm not telling you to be a Christian. I have zero authority to tell anybody what to believe. But if you did decide to go that route, then I will ask you this. If Christ is king, then surely he needs his knights. Are you worthy of that title? Exactly five years ago, the Notre Dame Cathedral was burned and the authorities said that it was an accident. But there are many questions and observations that indicate otherwise. Christians did nothing about the desecration of one of the most important and greatest monuments to beauty, architecture, mathematics, and Christianity. I believe that if the same thing happened 10 years from now, there would be a very different reaction. A good question to ask is, what's my stance in all this? Do I have a dog in this fight? Obviously, I am not off the West, so why should I really care? Well, from a personal standpoint, I have one foot in the West and one foot in the East. I was born in the East, but some of my most important memories are in the West. My first crush was in the West, but my first kiss was in the East. But the first time I got laid was in the West. Three different girls, mind you. 
I, the first money I made was in the West. All my degrees are earned in the West. In some sense, my home is in the West. So this gives me a wide perspective of the playing field. I respect and understand both cultures, and I can say with confidence that the West deserves to survive and thrive. Perhaps I am just a messenger of sorts. And secondly, my parents sacrificed much to get me and my sister here, and I'll be damned if I can't do my part to secure the price of their sacrifice. This, another question you should be asking me is, why did I stop being an atheist? I told you the story of me walking into my childhood home and watching my mom cry because she thought her brother was dead. I didn't tell you the full story. A few days before 9-11, my grandmother called and spoke to my mom and I overheard the whole conversation. My grandmother was telling my mom of a dream that she had. She described a dark and scary tunnel with a train track inside which was very confusing to her. In this vision, she saw a wondrous being of light running full speed at this train, furiously trying to stop it. She didn't know what to make of the dream, of course, but she knew that it was a sign of great danger to her son, my mother's brother, my uncle, who worked at the World Trade Center. She knew that she would pray for her son, but that's all she could really do. On 9-11, which is a few days after this dream, we genuinely thought he was dead. All communications went down after the attack and it was impossible to make a phone call to that area. But then he called. He was not dead. He was alive. And he told us the story. There was a subway station under the World Trade Center and he was going to get on the rail to go to that subway station because that's his office. He was late to work that day because something had come up, but he missed his regular time. He waited and got into the one right after, but some alarms went off and they had to evacuate. The one that he was supposed to be on was under the building at the time and was crushed by the collapse. How do you explain this kind of thing? I had kind of put this memory out of my mind for decades, but in recent years I've been observing more phenomena that challenge the purely materialistic worldview that I deeply held. Before I close out, I want to share one of these phenomena with you. I am actually really struggling because I don't know if I should share this because I don't think anybody's going to believe me. But it's fine. I think I'm driven to share this, so I'll, I'll do it. I want to show you something really cool. I want to show you the back of this jacket. The back of this jacket has this beautiful patch. And this is the painting of the Archangel Triumphant, Archangel Michael Triumphant. And it's important to me because I had a vision or dream of this painting years ago, and it struck with me, and it was in my memory. I didn't know it was a real painting. And then eventually I came to learn that it was a real painting. And I was just struck with awe because I'd seen this painting in detail before knowing it was even a real thing, a real physical painting. And I was in Europe last summer. I, I had a beautiful Europe tour. I, I traced the path of Hannibal Barca as he goes through Spain and France, through Italy, through the Alps and into actual Italy proper. And in that journey, in Florence, I had this jacket made. I didn't think of it too much. I went to Rome and I had this thought, why don't I just Google where this painting is actually located? And it turns out this painting is in a small little unknown church that was within walking distance of where I lived in Rome. Pure coincidence. And every day for seven days that I was in Rome, I went and spent time in this church. My first time ever spending any time in any church. And I suppose to some extent that the video that you are watching right now is a product of my experience in Rome.